Well, this is not green screen. All of this stuff around me is for real. <laughs> and so is what I'm about to tell you. So another dark episode. Um, and important one. So I would like to, before I get on to lighter stuff, paint a very dark picture. The dark picture I want to paint is what will happen if you do nothing once you realize that abrupt, imminent human extinction is on the cards? Something you will live through very shortly. Now, once you've come to terms with that and really gone through stages of grief, you get to a point where there's still a lot of decisions to, to be made. Uh, one of the primary things that I'm trying to push, an idea that I would like people to propagate and support me on, is, is the idea of a managed extinction, which is the default. That's pretty much what you'll get if you do nothing. And by managed extinction, I mean an extinction managed by the same people that caused our species to go extinct, the psychopaths that run the show, the leaders, the, uh, the thought leaders, the political leaders, the enforcers, the incarcerators, all these people in positions of power and authority that have run a financial system that has kept us enslaved by debt, they will run this system to the bitter end. And I want to paint a picture of just how bitter and dark it could possibly be, almost certainly will be. In Ness, we do what I'm proposing, and that is have an emancipation, a manumission extinction, which means that the powers that be let us go free. They open the gates. They start to take the pressure off the system that they've been running, uh, essentially a gulag, uh, for 8,000 years. So that we manage our own extinction in our own way. And we don't have it controlled anymore. We don't have it managed. We don't have it our extinction managed by rule of the gun, which is really where we're headed. Now, if you do nothing, if you don't point fingers and you say, well, let's not blame and kumbaya, you will almost definitely unleash genocides, holocausts that are waiting in the wings. There are many of them. There are about 9 million people that are incarcerated. And those people that are incarcerated around the world are at great risk. America has 4.4% of the world's population, but it has 25%. The land of the free has 25% of the world's prison population. And that's not including people that have been sectioned uh, with, for mental health reasons. Uh, that's not including people in the military, which are also incarcerated. Uh, to, uh, basically, they are not free to leave the military, and the military will be run in terms of extinction until it's past its usefulness. When soldiers uh, and coast guards, police, law enforcement will be finally let go to to return to their families, really when they can't be fed. So, bear that in mind if if you are one of these people in the security forces. Now, people are incarcerated not only in prisons, the, you are incarcerated in an urban environment. You really are a caged primate. And I want to start promoting the idea of releasing, taking off the pressure, taking off the totalitarianism and reversing the direction that it's going in. Otherwise, I want to scare the pants of you with a few th holocausts that are in the wings. Now, one of the first ones that is brewing is in Turkey. Now, if you go back to episode 5, uh, the one I did about Gebekli Tepe, I traveled there to film that in uh, late 2018. And I was absolutely appalled 
uh, when traveling there to see these vast camps, these vast camps with barbed wire fences, moats, uh, heavily militarized with uh, machine guns and rows and rows of these uh, really Nissan hats and tents. Um, They are death camps in the brewing. Now, they build as Syrian refugee camps, but why then, why they will turn into death camps, I need to give you a bit of background. Really, what we're talking about here is a psychopath we've mentioned before, Angela Merkel. This is Angela Merkel's Holocaust. So why that particular psychopath? Well, she's a Christian Democrat, and like all conservative Christians and psychopaths, she had has made the devil's bargain, and to save her political career, she's stepping down now. There will be a new psychopath, uh, a mini Angela, to take over from her. Um, but I would like people to recognize that this is Angela Merkel's Holocaust. Okay, what did she do? Well, she put her political career ahead of uh, more than a million Syrians that will almost certainly, in a uh, near-term extinction event, will suffer the same fate as uh, people did in Poland during the Nazi Holocaust, and for the same reasons. Now, why? Well, in order to save her political career, what Angela Merkel did was she paid Erdogan, the totalitarian dictator in Turkey, a hard cash. She put him in the uh, privatized prison business, to make sure that Syrian refugees didn't get to Germany where it was politically sensitive for her. So Germany really opened its arms to immigration to a certain extent. But German hospitality dried up very soon, uh, only after tens tens of thousands of immigrants uh, came through from uh, particularly Syria and the Middle East. Now, these are climate change refugees. Don't forget that. It's sold as a political upheaval, but they're really climate change refugees. So Germany, Germany's capacity to absorb refugees from the Middle East turned out to be very limited. So what Angela Merkel did was through the EU, uh, she paid Erdogan $3 billion and then another $3 billion, so $6 billion since uh, 2016, to capture these Syrians and put them in concentration camps and hold them there indefinitely. They almost certainly will never get out of there. I cannot imagine how they would get out of there in any normal circumstance. I can't imagine how Erdogan would release them. I can't imagine why Erdogan would release them. He's getting 400 euros a month per head for each refugee. He is in a very profitable business, and it's unlikely he would get out of that business, he needs the money. So, not only does he have an incentive to capture and imprison more people, he's actively pursuing it. He Now that things are quieting down in Syria, he's making moves uh, in Rojava against uh, Armenians, Kurds. Uh, he's really in the business of recruiting prisoners of war. Now, the prisoners of war will be given a simple option. It's, we can either rape and torture you in a Turkish hellhole or sign here and you can be a refugee and get 400 euros a month and stay in our wonderful little gulag. So, Angela Merkel put Erdogan in the privatized prison business so she could save what's left of her political career. This is bad. It's very, very bad. Because those Syrians, the fate of those Syrians will almost certainly be the fate of the people in Poland during the Nazi Holocaust. Why? Because it's unlikely, in my view, that the EU will be able to support Erdogan to the tune of 3 billion or so uh, every couple of years uh, in order to... uh, keep Turkey as a as a large prison camp. Deutsche Bank is broke. Uh, they couldn't pay a coupon recently that converted to shares, and there was almost a banking crisis for this tiny 
coupon premium that they couldn't pay. They had to borrow money and they printed the, you know, the, the uh, EU had to print their way out of it. It, it. The financial system around the world, and particularly Deutsche Bank and hence Germany, uh, is, is bankrupt. Um, I cannot imagine how in a in an environment where, say, there's a crop failure and the price of food skyrockets, that the EU will have the money to carry on paying Erdogan to keep these prisoners. Then imagine what happens to them. He can't release them. He can't feed them. What's going to happen to them? I think it's obvious. Right there where those camps are is called the Armenian Highlands. It was the site of the first Holocaust. Now, you probably think there's only one Holocaust. Well, there have been many, and one of the, the first modern Holocausts of the 20th century was the Armenian Genocide. Now, you probably haven't heard of the Armenian Genocide, and one of the reasons is because Turkey did such a thorough job that there are very few Armenians left to have a voice to remind the world about it. Unlike, say, the Jews in... Uh, in Poland that were, were killed, there's a large Jewish community all over the world that have really reminded the world about the Holocaust. True for, often for Zionist reasons, which I don't agree with, but there were f too few Armenians to have a voice to, to remind the world about the Armenian genocide, uh, about Two, two million or so Armenians were in Turkey. About 1.5 million were systematically murdered. How it was done was th really a number of ways, including gassing. They would get uh, particularly children and put them at the second floor of a school building and then release gas on the first floor to, to gas them. Uh, most of the people were killed by forced marches through the deserts, exactly pretty much where Gebekli Tepe was when I was doing that filming. They were forced marched uh, without food and water until they suffered dehydration, death by heat stroke. Uh, some of the only ways to, to get out of it uh, was the, the few survivors that came out of those forced marches in the deserts were were tragic indeed and those were um, young girls that were pretty now why they survived is that if they caught the idea of a, the eye of a Turkish officer uh, then uh, they would be singled out and their spouse uh, an Armenian husband say would be shot their children would be killed in front of them and then they would be dragged off to a registration office to to get married to the Turkish officer. Uh, in Turkey today, I believe there are lots of people that have grandmothers with a secret past, that they were these traumatized Armenian women that had to just forget their previous life and begin a new life of rape from a Turkish officer um, and a new family and just continue as if they Turkish and live a kind of double life. Uh, truly, truly horrendous situation. Now, I know that everybody's head explodes if you don't say the regular narrative, the cartoon version of what happened during the German Nazi Holocaust in Poland. Okay, I, I'm going to stick my neck out here in a world where you have to do this Zionist propaganda view of the Holocaust. I, I don't believe it's correct, and I want to give you the correct reason, because if you stick with the cartoon version of what happened in the Holocaust, and that is basically Hitler was a nasty man that hated Jews, so he systematically decided to engineer a system to kill them um, en masse, is not correct. Okay. My interpretation of the Holocaust, and bear in mind that we live in a world where in Britain you can go to jail for a joke teaching a dog to do a Nazi salute, and in Austria, the home of Hitler, and the place where all the anti-Semitism came from, it didn't come from Bavaria, it came from Vienna. So, hooray for Austria, they have the best PR team known to man, that now you associate uh, Nazi genocide with Germany. Really should be with Austria. But anyway... 
in the same totalitarian fascist mindset, which, which Austrians have not got over, they now prosecute you for Holocaust denial if you reinterpret the Holocaust in any way whatsoever or question it, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm pro I could be risking jail time in Austria for just publishing this, this video, possibly. But I'm prepared to do it because I'm prepared because it's necessary that you understand what happened in the Holocaust so that it doesn't happen again. Now, to cut a long story short, it was simple, is the lesson from all these Holocausts is don't lock people up. If you lock people up, you are responsible for them. If you cannot feed them, you are in the Holocaust business. You will have to euthanize them. If you can't feed them and you can't release them, you are going to have to start killing them or starving them to death. Killing them would be a mercy killing because starving to death is an extremely, extremely unpleasant way to go. And I think that's where Germany got to. So let me tell you my interpretation of what happened in the Holocaust and you'll see why the situation in Turkey is so dangerous, the situation in America and Europe is so dangerous. And China and all these, and Russia, all these places where they have nine million people incarcerated. If their crop failures are uh, in the beginnings of, of an extinction event, um, those people will be in an unnecessary, brutal situation. Now, don't forget that incar incarceration includes, say, the, the military in uh, in. NATO in Europe and America, if you're in the security forces, you are incarcerated. You're not free to leave whenever you want to. And, and if there are crop failures and food, the price of food rises, you can see that basically your mess tray, will, the food on it will deteriorate and you will not be allowed to leave. They will keep you in the military until you pass your usefulness. They're in a managed extinction they they will not release you from the military until basically you've you've done your dirty deeds to the last. Uh, the same in, implies with the prison population. America is four point four percent of the world's population, but it has twenty five percent or twenty two to twenty five percent of the world's prisoners. The land of the free has a quarter of the world's population in prison. Uh, so. The big offenders are America first, and Russia and China. China has a million Uyghurs. Those Uyghurs are in the same position as the Syrian refugees are under Erdogan. And they are a genocide waiting to happen. There's a genocide waiting to happen just in America. In, the, in terms of the prison population, in terms of people that are incarcerated for mental health reasons against their will. Um, and even you, as an ordinary citizen, are essentially a primate caged in an urban en environment. So, yes, it's very important that they open the cages and start to reverse this tide of uh, incarceration. Otherwise, they will ri wind up like the Nazis in Germany. And let me explain what I think happened there. So my interpretation of why uh, the, the primary reason that the, uh, the Holocaust happened the second Holocaust, um, was really because of food uh, and the fact that Hitler and the Nazis couldn't feed the millions that they had put into labor camps. Their intention was to put them into labor camps and work them to death uh, or just keep them as slaves, keep them as a resource, basically like your human resource uh, you have a HR department. They probably call themselves talent management now for PR reasons, but they're human resources. If you think of humans as resources like American corporations do and keep them in a debt-based incarceration, you are doing exactly what Hitler did, keeping people in labor camps, everybody he doesn't like, which was a huge swathe. Um, LGBTM people, gypsies, political prisoners, and Jews. So... If you incarcerate a large portion of your population, you have to feed them. And that was the problem. Germany launched the war on a policy of guns and butter. Now, what that meant was that there was an article 
of faith that they took for granted is that you can't wage a war in Germany uh, unless you keep the population sweet. They will lose support for the war as soon as they lose all their creature comforts. And so the Nazis decided that they could do the impossible. They could do a, a war where manufacturing made guns, but they would still make butter and keep everybody comfortable at home. There wouldn't be rationing. There wouldn't be any of these things that would make the war unpopular. It would be sport, in other words. So it didn't work, of course. Forced labor and managed labor, as every American corporation knows, and every second-line manager knows, and every executive in America knows, is that managed labor is very inefficient. It's capitalism's big secret. Now, you soon find that out as if you put people in a, in a concentration camp and a labor camp and get them to work for you. They don't work very efficiently and they still eat. So what Hitler found by, um, by 1941 was the, uh, the fact he had to make a forced move. And the forced move was he needed food and oil uh, to feed Germany. Now, the occupied territories did not provide enough food for the guns and butter policy. So Hitler's forced move was to invade Russia. The move was simply to get hold of the grain, uh, particularly in the Ukraine and the, the oil um, in the southern Baikonur region and um, the Ukraine. How it backfired was they decided they would wait uh, until June the 22nd, basically when the the, the wheat was planted, they would have to do a blitzkrieg to capture all the wheat fields so that they could take the wheat back to Germany. It was uh, called the, the Hunger Plan, and it was an incredibly, incredibly cynical pathological move that would just, you know, quite equal to the mindset of Angela Merkel. And they knew that that would mean that 30 to 40 million, I think Goebbels had a green book where it was estimated that 30 to 40 million Russians would starve because their, their food would be taken to feed Germans. And, um, you know, typical psychopathic consequentialist view was they thought that was fair because Germans were superior and Slavs, um, the word slave, you're a wage slave, your, your wage slave word came from the Slavs. Slavs were the Romans' go-to pantry for getting slaves, and that's where the word comes from. So slaves and people in incarceration could die of hunger to the tune of 30 to 40 million. Um, obviously, the obvious happened. Germany's blitzkrieg didn't work. The Russians had a scorched earth policy, and by burning those crops... They essentially sealed the fate of the people in the labor camps in Poland. Because even before Stalingrad, uh, the logistical planners in Germany could see that they were never going to get the food and oil that they needed to survive. Now, if people were going to starve, they were going to starve preferentially in Jordan Peterson's lovely little hierarchy. The people on the labor, labor camps are at the bottom. And they are going to be fed last after everybody else. So German officers and the SS continually had this defense that the mass killings in the death camps were actually uh, mercy killings. Because dying of hunger is, is, is such an awful death, they used it even as a punishment um, to, to starve people um, and to disorientate them psychologically, to keep them... Uh, docile and uh, it's such it's such an unpleasant way to go that they did things uh, did other more systematic methods of killing off people that they couldn't feed and that's really what happened in the Nazi Holocaust so the takeaway lesson is don't lock people up because you have to feed them if you can't feed them and that's the situation we're going into we're going into the into crop failures, into droughts, into uh, food prices that skyrocket. 
in those situations, if you have people locked up, you have a guaranteed genocide on your hands. So America has the potential for the biggest Holocaust uh, in an extinction event. China is next on the list and uh, and then Russia. So it's simple. Instead of increasing the rates of incarceration as panic, uh, climate change induced panic starts, uh, America, given its psychopathic tendencies, is you know really the German English speaking world is really a breeding ground for psychopathy, and the psychopaths will increase the rate of car incarceration um, in, uh, as waves come up from the south through through Mexico, waves of uh, humanitarian uh, desperados. Though they will incarcerate them at an ever increasing rate, I'm saying. They should do the opposite. We should start emancipating people. There should be a systematic program to reduce the rate of incarceration. There should, it's uh, the, at least the, say for instance, nonviolent prisoners should be uh, let go. Um, the uh, particularly uh, people that are in jail for crimes like drug crimes and you know really ridiculous uh, reasons for jailing people uh, should be released and integrated into the community. Why? Because at some stage they're going to find out that there is a genuine extinction event on the horizon and I don't think you'll be able to contain them. I don't think you will be able to keep prisoners in those camps, um, in prisons throughout America uh, once the word is out. Um, and then you're going to have a lot of violent and angry people uh, streaming out uh, to take vengeance. I would say you should start a program of manumission. For example, start getting the land back from uh, you know these, these big agra uh, and start giving it up to homesteaders, that people that in cities that want to face extinction through homesteading. Uh, that kind of uh, thing. Um, use the corn subsidy to buy back land uh, from these big uh, monster in Sanito and, uh, and all the, the, the mass food production system. Start to localize it um, for people that want make that choice. Um, and I think in terms of if, if you're a, a lawyer, for example, I would suggest that you find a test case. Uh, find somebody that has been in prison, particularly on drugs charges where the, you have these ridiculous, uh, nonviolent, often white collar uh, drug offenders, and they are being incarcerated for ridiculous terms, maybe 80 years. Now, I believe you could challenge the federal government in saying that in an extinction, it's a cruel and unusual punishment to put somebody in jail for. 80 years. They haven't been given a life sentence or a death sentence. But in the light of the fact that the government knows there's an extinction event coming imminently, uh, you could make a very good test case from a suitable candidate. And uh, it would be worthwhile for a number of reasons. For one thing, you could force the government into a position where they have to reveal all the information that they have. And I've already given you some of the documents in previous videos on how the you know the government assumes that there is imminent um, and abrupt climate change induced extinction in the near term, um, and there are enough documents that possibly could be sourced in a in a legal case in a test case, um, maybe a class action lawsuit for all the prisoners incarcerated at the at the moment that say have longer than a ten year sentence. It could, I think you could make a case for it being cruel and unusual punishment. But even if you're not a doomer, you could uh, essentially force government scientists onto the stand. You could f force. Uh, civilian scientists onto the stand to testify on the seriousness of climate change. If you one of the people that think you, we can still do something about it, uh, you could force that into the public arena and uh, force information out of uh, you know freedom of information. And uh, you could 
essentially establish that the government knows what's coming. They're not sharing it. They're in a panic mode or rather panic management mode. And I think it would be better for everybody um, if you took a pro bono case that forced this out into the open. Once the government is forced to show its cards, uh, then we can begin the process of an of a emancipation extinction. And my vision for it is what I've said before. It's uh, what I've said is Catalonia, 1936. So I, I will go into what that is and, and another road another way we could have a better class of extinction if it can be such a thing but it um i'd go so far as to say it could almost be a beautiful extinction where we headed if you do nothing is the kind of extinction that people suffered in the holocaust and if you're a christian i want to remind you that when I was at school, I was told by a Christian priest that these people lined up for the gas, gas uh, chambers. And I was told when I was a boy at school that horror of horrors, you know how bad it was that one of them said, there is no God. That's 10 minutes away from the gas chambers. He had his epiphany that, yes, Christianity, the there is no God. It's a lie. We've been lied to all along. There is no God. So I was told that in school as, uh, you know, that's how bad it was that they could make you give up your faith in those final And it's like, well, it kind of backfired on me because I think that we should give up our faith. We should give it up early. So we have more than 10 minutes before the gas chamber. That's what I feel. And I want to push the idea of a free, freedom now, freedom from debt. I think we need a debt jubilee. I think we must start scaling back. Debt has always been the means of slavery, the hidden means of slavery, the hidden means of bondage. So we need things like a debt jubilee. We need these things to come out. We need personalities, uh, celebrities to come out and declare, say, November the 5th as uh, jubilee day for debt corporate, private debts, everything is wiped clean in the interests of uh, freedom, in the interests of emancipation, so that we can meet our fate free, as free people to choose, and not as managed resources. The human Resource department, the HR department, should be retired. The law should be changed. Things like, for example, suicide is not legal in every state. Assisted suicide is not legal in every state. And, and euthanasia is not legal, I think, in most states and even in terms of the federal government. We should start changing the law to allow those kind of things, start thinking in those kind of ways. And, yeah, I, I would say instead of saying, no, don't blame, don't point fingers, yes, it's an important part of catharsis to have blame. I would like to see the law change for euthanasia because there are psychopaths out there that are incur incurable and they need to be euthanized. <laughs>